Hi, I'm Earl Silverman, Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Rheumatology. Every year, the journal acknowledges a highly influential research article published in the Journal of Rheumatology with the presentation of the Duncan A. Gordon Award. This recognition, this recognition is presented in honor of our longtime editor, the late Dr. Duncan Gordon, and is awarded to the authors of the article that has the greatest potential in, to advance treatment and alter clinical practice in rheumatology based on its impact and originality as voted by the editorial committee of the Journal of Rheumatology. As you know, this award has in the past been presented at our annual reception at the ACR, but as the ACR will be a virtual event this year, I cannot do it in person, sadly. However, I am fortunate to be able to present the award virtually and to speak to one of the, the authors, in fact, the lead, first author in a more in-depth manner about the article. So today I'm pleased to announce the winner and here is the Duncan Gordon Award, which I promise, can you see it okay? Or is the virtual background getting it out? Can you see it okay, Dr. Saint? I can see part of it, but yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute. No, that probably doesn't help. The problem is, of course, it's, it's see-through, so it's hard to see, but I promise he will get it in the future. So, Anyway, I'm pleased to announce the winner for 2021 is given to the article entitled Rates of Total Joint Replacement, Replacement in the United States, Future Projections to 2020-2040 Using National Inpatient Sample by Dr. Jasvinder Singh, Xiao Hu Yu, Lang Chen, and John Cleveland. Today, I'm pleased to be speaking to Dr. Singh from the University of Alabama, who was the first author, who is the first author of the award-winning article. This article is currently available for your viewing as an open access article at jroom.org. So I already showed you the award and I wanna congratulate you and your co-authors on winning the 2021 Duncan A. Gordon Award. And I'm pleased that you could join me to discuss in this interesting, important article. So now I'd like to briefly have the opportunity to discuss the article with Dr. Singh. So what do you think, what, in your opinion, what are the most important messages from the article? So uh, Earl, first off, I wanna thank the journal for this uh, honor and privilege and it's, it's my delight to be discussing this with you and the audience uh, on behalf of our team. Uh, in terms of uh, the most important messages from this article, I think there are two. First, that um, in this study, we found that a rapidly rising number of Americans are undergoing hip and knee replacement surgeries to relieve symptom pain and disability from and stage symptomatic hip and knee arthritis, and that this number is projected to increase significantly by 2030 and 2040 if the current rate of increase continues. Compared to 2014, the numbers of annual hip and knee replacements in the US will be somewhere between two and a half fold or so higher by 2030, and somewhere between four to five fold higher by 2040. Um, as an example, in uh, 2030, if the trend continues, there'd be 1.4 million hip and 1.9 million knee replacements annually in the US. And this compares to 370,000 or so hips and 680,000 knee replacements in 2014. So it's a rapid increase. So that's the first message I believe from this paper. The second message is that the increase in the volume is seen for both females and males and in all age groups. Uh, although the increase was slightly more for females and for age group 45 to 64 and 65 to 84, it was seen in all groups. It's very interesting, the fact that it was really seen in all groups. So, which leads really to my next question is what factors do you think may account for this rising incidence. It's obviously, as you said, not just an aging population. 
Right. So, so that's a, that's an important question that all of us want to ask because should we find those factors, we can potentially uh, bend the curve if some of them are modifiable. Uh, we did not study them specifically in this study because the data source does not uh, give a wealth of information about these factors, but others have very elegantly studies in epidemiological, national, and even across national studies. And some of the potential contributors to this are uh, increasing uh, obesity um, in the US. There is an obesity uh, epidemic. Um, there's also an expansion of joint replacement uh, to younger and older people, uh, even those with high comorbidities, because the surgery has been um, has been shown to be quite safe. Uh, so the so the indications are expanding to both uh, ends of the spectrum, uh, in the age spectrum. I think that aging of the population is contributing as well over time not as a major factor, but a contributing factor. And uh, in the end, I think that the um, somewhat limited expansion in medical, effective medical treatments for osteoarthritis, which is the major driver of the knee and hip replacements, also does contribute um, to the increasing annual volume of these procedures. It's very interesting, you know, you, you hit on something that about the ease of it. And I was really impressed where a colleague of mine, um, his wife showed a picture of him going home the day, the same day of his hip replacement, you know, and the gentleman is over 65. So it was very impressive how the surgery and the advances are unbelievable. I mean, the thought that you would go home the same day of hip surgery, you know, 10 years ago, I think we would not have guessed this. You're absolutely right. You know, somebody else I know, he, uh, another colleague, you know, he got his knee replaced, his hip, no, it was a hip again, because he wanted to go back to playing golf and skiing. I think this more active lifestyle also. Fascinating. It's great. So what is, so I know you, you address this a little bit, but I don't know if your data had any could you get down to inflammatory versus OA? I would have predicted that inflammatory arthritis, maybe you haven't seen it yet, but over time, biologics, we hope, would decrease the incidence of replacement for inflammatory arthritis. So, so that's an excellent question, Earl. Um, in this data set, we did not analyze by the uh, principal diagnosis. Uh, because, uh, again, the data set um, has some limitations, and that was not the focus of the study. However, we know from uh, a plenty of previously published national studies, uh, and over time, what you indicate is actually correct. First, uh, we know that the proportion of people who undergo uh, total knee or total hip replacement that less than five to 10% of them have inflammatory conditions as the underlying condition. Um, the, the, the other issue is that um, over time, we have all in rheumatology seen an explosion of very effective treatments, both a better use of the existing disease modifying agents from the 70s and 80s in the, in the last three decades, as well as discovery of new targeted therapies such as biologic and targeted synthetic therapies in many of these conditions. So uh, there's already emerging evidence that that may have contributed to a lower proportion of our patients with inflammatory arthritis needing these surgeries It may have pushed it by another decade or two, perhaps. Uh, again, we need even longer uh, follow-up duration studies with those, you know, those that can monitor patients over one to three decades. But there's already evidence uh, with regards to that. So uh, it seems that the, the relative proportion of people with inflammatory arthritis conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis may be going down as a cause of uh, total knee, total joint replacement as opposed to osteoarthritis, which obviously with, uh, with aging as well as obesity pandemic where there's a clear association of a body mass index with knee arthritis and 
progression to total joint replacement uh, may be happening over time. I think one other thing to also keep in mind is that a lot of patients uh, with inflammatory arthritis can also develop concomitant osteoarthritis and may actually, at some point in time, it becomes difficult other than a surgical diagnosis intra-op uh, to uh, clearly identify the main reason, and sometimes it's uh, both combined. Um, so I think those factors are also there, but you're right. I think over time, there are indications that uh, inflammatory arthritis may be a less contributor to a progression to total joint replacement as opposed to osteoarthritis, may, which may be on rise. Thank you. And so really, my last question is, how well do you think the U.S. data reflects the world data? It's always an interesting question. I think we need other studies, but it's pure speculation. So, of course, it's, it's, it's tenuous to generalize from one country setting to another. Um, due to a variety of causes, uh, uh, you know, the healthcare system, uh, reimbursement, availability of surgery, um, and uh, even differences in types of implants and other things as well. Um, you know, life expectancy differs across nations. Uh, however, similar but less impressive increases over time in the need for total knee and hip replacement have been shown from uh, several other Western countries in the recent decades. Uh, uh, you know, uh, several studies from Canada, uh, Australia, many parts of Europe, um, and even Far East have shown that the annual volume of these surgeries is increasing across the globe. Um, uh, I think that um, the world is getting to be a smaller place and is facing some of the similar problems that we have here in the U.S., um, some of which is the increasing rates of overweight and obesity, uh, aging of the population and increasing life expectancy, and increased access to this surgery. Uh, which may also be shared by the rest of the world. Thank you. Um, any further comments that maybe we didn't touch upon that you'd like to add before we end the discussion? Sure. So I think I'd like to just maybe highlight uh, 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 one strength and a couple of limitations which uh, readers must uh, consider as they're thinking about or looking at our data. Um, we conducted this national study that used the U.S. national inpatient sample from 2000 to 2014 and performed several sensitivity analyses, which, which, which support the robustness of some of the findings. Uh, however, there's some study limitations that, that readers must consider. One is that we uh, assume the continuous increase in the volume of hip and knee replacements which may plateau over time, either because of plateauing of the incidence of osteoarthritis, which is a major contributor to these, or policy change or payment rules. Um, and the other thing that I'd like to point out is the policy implications of these findings. Uh, so what our study hopefully does is provide the policymakers um, some data about the future that may inform the allocation of resources and future planning and public health uh, and national policies. I think that these data can also uh, provide some insights into the, uh, the, the severe gap in the supply of arthroplasty orthopedic surgeons that may be needed in another 10 to 15 years versus what we have currently. Um, also some, uh, some sort of policy that can uh, follow the additional evidence that comes from uh, other studies that high volume centers and high volume surgeons lead to better outcomes of knee replacement versus community practices, which at least in US and Canada do account for a large proportion of all arthroplasties. Uh, so some sort of national policies that can further um, allow people to have better outcomes at the same time, not limiting access to only tertiary care centers. Um, would be helpful for the for the populations. I think those are very important points. In Canada, certainly, I don't think volume in community is an issue. I mean, the wait lists are so long that I think the average orthopedic surgeon in the community who deals with knee and hip arthroplasty over a 10-year period does develop 
excellent expertise just for the same reason at the tertiary centers. The volumes are huge for the reasons you say, and it's going to get more. So any medical students out there, you know, if one wants to be super busy, there is a, and you're interested in orthopedics and arthroplasty, the future is yours. We, and anyway, I want to thank you for this for winning the Duncan Gordon Award and for this very interesting discussion and taking the time to speak to me. And we will send you the award and hopefully next year, we'll all be able to do in person and we'll get to catch up to thank, to see you. It's been a while. And to see everybody at the ACR and at our reception and present at least acknowledge everybody, the people who we couldn't acknowledge in person. And I want to thank our viewers and suggest they read the article, the full-length article entitled Rates of Total Joint Replacement in the United States, Future Projections to 2020 to 2040 using the National Inpatient Sample by Dr. Singh, Yu Chen, and Cleveland. It's available at jroom.org. And we'd love to hear your comments on Twitter at jroom or by email at manuscripts at jroom.com. And thank you for joining us. And thank you again, Dr. Singh. Thank you, Dr. Silverman. It's a pleasure. Um,